Go for it. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, presentation tonight. I think, you know, you're in for a treat. And Monty Murray will introduce our speaker in a few minutes. Just want to talk a little bit about Southway conservationists. Two things that, that uh, I would like to point out. Number one, if you're interested in our organization, I recommend that you check our website. It's an excellent website. And there's a lot of information on there about our calendar, our activities. The other thing is we're always in recruiting mode. So if you know anybody who might be interested in doing conservation related work, <clears throat> excuse me, we, uh, we're always trying to recruit people. So we, uh, we always keep our eyes open for that. We're, South Wake is very, very active in a lot of activities. In fact, you could probably argue that right now, maybe we're a little bit too active. But anyway, we have a bunch of activities we concentrate on. And the next month or so, next month and a half, we're going to be very busy. Four of the areas, you know, we're really busy right now. One of them has to do with deer donations. <clears throat> and with the deer donations, we actually have a process where venison uh, will be donated to food banks and to worthy individuals. Another area we have is called Eco Kids. <clears throat> We're trying to get programs going where we have involvement from you know, children, get them <clears throat> ecologically and environmentally sensitive because again, the future is theirs. We have an Eco Kids uh, initiative coming up at Hemlock Bluffs Park in Cary on November the 14th. Another area we're involved in is uh, we maintain and sometimes create pollinator gardens. Right now we have three pollinator gardens going on in Wake County and we're about to start a fourth one at Bass Lake Park in Holly Springs. <clears throat> we're, we're looking you know, for help uh, for volunteers. On the 30th of October, we're going to go ahead and prepare the flower bed. And then on the 6th of November, we're actually gonna plant approximately 200 plants, uh, you know, shade tolerant plants. And we're gonna have uh, assistance from the Cub Scouts. So anybody interested in helping out, you know, we definitely could use the help. And then the last area I would like to point out is we also plant trees. We have a Trees for Trash program and on November the 19th at the North Carolina Museum of Art, we're actually gonna be, gonna be planting 61 trees and shrubs. And again, uh, we could definitely use the help. So that's kind of a summary of uh, what we're doing with South Wake. And I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our president elect, Monty Murray. Uh, thank you, thank you, John. Um, so I'm very, very pleased to, uh, to welcome today um, Andy Tate, who is the forestry director at Eco Foresters, which is located in Asheville, beautiful mountain country. And Eco Foresters is a professional forestry association. It's a nonprofit. It's focused on environmentally sound forestry practices. And Andy previously, prior to being at uh, Eco Forester uh, for the last six or seven years was with the US Forest Service at their Southern Research Station in Asheville, working on forest stewardship in, in the Southern Appalachian uh, forests. He brings experience with cutting edge upland hardwood silviculture and integrated forest health management. He's worked on a number of uh, natural resource conservation projects in that region since 2005. Tonight, he'll be talking to us about ecologically beneficial forestry that improves all the forest values, That's the water, the wildlife, uh, the biodiversity, and of course, timber. Um, so with no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Andy. Great, well, thank you for that warm introduction, Monty. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to speak to your group. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and Go ahead and get started here with my screen sharing going. And then I'll have a break about halfway through for questions and then questions at the end also again. So you'll have a couple of chances to answer questions, to ask questions. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions you have as they come up. So can you all see my screen now, my slides up there? Yes, they look great. Good, good, thank you. Um, so let me get this screen up for me too. Yeah, so Monica, I'm, I'm the forester. I'm a registered forester in North Carolina. There's my contact information. Feel free to jot that down. I'll share it later too if you have any follow-up questions later. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or all about things. Um, and talking about ecological forestry and wildlife in particular to kind of tap into um, your, your all's mission as an organization for NC Wildlife presentation. So um, the overview of the presentation, I'll give you a quick intro to ecoforesters, give you a little bit of brief history and current conditions for Piedmont and Appalachian forests. Um, it's important to understand that and then talk about the process of ecological forestry assessing the conditions, creating a plan to meet your goals, and then implementing the plan is kind of the crucial step. And I'll talk about some incentives for forest stewardship and conservation a little bit uh, to help with the process. So as Marnie kind of said, um, this is our mission statement. We are a 501c3 nonprofit professional or forestry organization dedicated to conserving and restoring Appalachian forests through education and stewardship. We do two things. We actually do these kind of events educate people, but also do boots on the ground forestry work uh, to implement what we're recommending for people as well. Both parts are really important to our mission. So what do I do? As a consulting forest, I provide all the services a consulting forest would provide. I write forest stewardship plans for people. Um, we do timber harvest for people. We control non-native invasive plants. A full service forestry organization, that, again, is boots on the ground, actually doing um, you know, on the ground improvements to forest out there. We also are a nonprofit organization that does outreach and educational events like this presentation here. We rely on donations and grants to support that work. So we think it's also really important not just to work with the landowners that are our clients and help them, but to try and educate and get more people to do uh, what we call ecologically beneficial or positive impact forestry. We work with a number of other nonprofit organizations here in the region trying to get a lot more uh, you know, bang for our buck by having collaboration and a lot more done by working with other organizations that have similar missions. Um, those are really important. I'll talk about some of those in a minute. Uh, we have some pretty impressive advanced digital mapping and remote sensing capabilities. We can tell you the, the heights of the trees on your property you know, from my desk, um, which is pretty amazing that's happened recently to have that. I'm always looking for new technology and the, and the best cutting edge practices to really do the best forestry out there and to share that with as many people as possible. Um, so quick overview of our, some of our conservation partnership work to highlight. We have a, the Forest Fund, which is we raised about $60,000 from local businesses in, in outdoor related industries, for everything from outdoor recreation companies to the breweries, a lot of breweries in Asheville um, that rely on the water quality here and even from Timber Forest Products Company to raise funds to help land trusts steward the land that they have permanently protected because they spent all their time and money getting the land, but they don't always have the funds to do things like control non-native invasive species on their property. So we're actually raised funds so we can do work for them and help these other nonprofit organizations really be good managers and do ecological forestry and improve their forests. And we'll talk about why that's really needed, even on these permanently protected you know, nature preserves, they, they need management too, really. Uh, we have a community forest project for in Sandy Mush communities in the area northwest of Asheville, a watershed about 50,000 acres. And it's a very tight knit community out there and they have a huge problem with invasive plants and unsustainable forest management. We have a community project trying to help the whole community work together on things like invasive plants, you know, don't obey property lines. You can control every single one on your property but if you're surrounded by your neighbors with invasive plants, they're going to keep coming onto your property. So it's really important that there is a, a more of a cooperative community level approach to these things. We're trying to do that. We are involved with the Nantahala and Pisgah National Forest planning process. Um, it's been 13 years of meetings to try and come up with a plan for the national forests in Western North Carolina. And they've been meeting once a month for a whole day for 13 years and finally have a draft plan and it's still controversial. They still can't all agree on everything. Um, some other services we've done with some of uh, the regional nonprofits, the Nature Conservancy, we've actually done an oak restoration timber harvest on a Nature Conservancy, nature conservancy preserve. And uh, we did a big project with the Foothills Conservancy, which is in Morganton. They just bought a 600 acre community forest 
that they're developing for recreational use for the community. They're going to do some ecological timber harvesting on the property as well. They also have non-native invasive species. We wrote a really comprehensive plan for them, and now we're helping them implement the plan using some of our funding to really help them out. Um, our biggest client is the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and they own 50,000 acres in far western North Carolina, right next to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And we kind of oversee everything they do out there from the forest planning process to timber sales, to invasive species control, um, to trying to get them to do more prescribed fire, all kinds of things. That's kind of the highlights of some of our conservation partnership work. That it's really our nonprofit side. We do fundraising, get donations and grants to help support this work that we're doing. Apart from our fee for service work we do for private landowners. So, um, I'm going to launch right into a brief history of the Piedmont and Appalachian forests. My, you know, area of immediate expertise is the, is the Appalachians, the mountains. So some of this will be a little more mountain relevant, but I definitely tried to tie in a lot of Piedmont stuff. I love this picture here. Um, this is in the mountains. These are chestnut trees. Back, you know, 100, 100 years ago, a little more, chestnuts all died in the 30s and 40s. These were the dominant giants of the feather maybe one quarter of the trees in the mountains were chestnuts and you can see those are you know full-grown men in that picture there these trees were eight ten feet in diameter massive trees incredible food supply for animals and for humans people would you know chestnuts an open flyer fire they would actually collect these things and sell them in town and they're delicious you can still eat the asian chestnuts that are around but the american ones are all gone now been a huge loss to our forest it was the most uh, durable rot resistant and workable wood. It was a fantastically valuable timber tree as well. Um, so there's a lot of things that have happened that have made our forests a lot less diverse and a lot lower quality than they used to be 100 or 200 years ago. There's been some dramatic changes and there's still ongoing changes. I'll talk about these things here. Um, getting more into the Piedmont forest history may be where this, but 1700s up until about 1930, there was massive land clearing in the Piedmont area for corn and cotton farming primarily. Um, and then a lot of these farmlands, you know, weren't real flat and it wasn't really ideal conditions and they weren't managed very well. There was lots of erosion and the topsoil washed away. And that picture you can see there in the upper right, that is of a real Southern Appalachia, it's in South Carolina actually, of an old farm. And some of these farms you know, weren't totally flat and they just all washed away. The topsoil is all gone. You're down to bare red clay subsoil, which is very unproductive and totally useless for farming. So a lot of these farms eroded, were, were worn out, and they were abandoned. And lots of abandoned land out there. And it was eroding and just eroding. Bare land erodes even faster. Uh, but all that tilling from the agriculture really disturbed the soil and, and lost a lot of that capability in the land. So a lot of times they came in and said, oh, this is terrible. You got to do something about it. So they replanted trees to try and stabilize the land. And it was largely loblolly pine trees that were planted across large swaths of the, of the Piedmont area. And it really um, it did a good job in stabilizing these badly eroded sites, held the soil in place, and gave them a chance to kind of restore a little bit. Uh, but it wasn't a natural thing to have you know, thousands and thousands of acres of these loblolly pine plantations across the Piedmont, and I'll talk more about that, but you can see that the devastation out there was really dramatic, the erosion that happened, and, and the, predict the productivity of the land has been greatly reduced because of that, and that's why the forest in the Piedmont definitely aren't as productive as they used to be, you know, 200 years ago or more. Um, so, um, the, what happened in the mountains a little bit later, the mountains were kind of spared until about 1870 when the railroads came through, and then once the railroads came through Asheville in 1870s, they could get the timber out of here and there was you know massive expanses of timbers and the same thing that happened in the piedmont happened in the mountains too it was all clear cut you wouldn't believe it now out here now it looks like it's all forested everywhere but it was all cut in the sometime in the past 100 150 years everything was cut pretty much 85 percent was totally clear cut whole mountainsides laid bare there was massive erosion problems here too um and there were even places where this the streams got so muddy the fish died in the streams um, luckily around here, they didn't convert most of it to farmland, so the trees regrew, and the forests we see now here are second or even third growth forests that are still pretty good, but not nearly the quality, the size, or the quality of the diversity of the forests that were here, again, 150 years ago or so in the mountains. has been a dramatic change. This has happened all over the whole eastern U.S., and in the west too even, but to a little lesser extent. 
but just massive deforestation took place 100 years ago. And that's, that's, that's an important, huge fact to realize. Um, obviously, no one liked all that clear cutting. It was very unpopular. People saw the, the damage and it was something that was, they realized, oh, this is not good. We can't keep doing this massive clear cutting. And it wasn't even done well. So it wasn't forestry. It was just pure resource extraction. Let's get the trees and get them out as quickly as possible. So that's why there was such bad erosion um, and such devastation afterwards. But what's happened since then, since people have just kind of realized that, you know, clear cutting is very unpopular with the public, they've gone to what's called, oh, we'll do a selective harvest, um, which is usually implemented as a diameter limit cut, where they only cut the trees above a certain minimum diameter, usually in the mountains, it's somewhere around 16 inches. In the Piedmont, it can be 14 or 12 inches. And they'll say, oh, I'll just cut the big trees and I'll leave little ones to grow. Well, it turns out those, those trees are all the same age because it was all clear cut a long time ago. And the trees that are bigger are just the trees that were better adapted, had better genetics, um, and didn't have health problems, had a little bit better conditions around them. So harvesting the biggest trees, those are also the best trees that really had the best genetics. And so by harvesting the biggest and best trees, you're really removing the fittest trees and their genetics from the stand, and you're leaving behind the trees that were really losing out in competition and may have been poorer quality trees to start with. So it degrades the forest greatly over time. And this has become the common practice, which is what pretty much every logger or timber buyer around here does because it's the simplest way for them to make money. The biggest and best trees are the most valuable, have the highest profit margins. So that's what they do. Um, it's a very short term way of looking. It is not a sustainable or any kind of forestry practice. It again is pure short-term economics, harvest the best, leave the rest, and it has greatly degraded our forest. And this has been the common practice for the past 100 years, pretty much, what's been going on. A wide scale, again, across the whole eastern U.S., certainly, and definitely out west, too. It's, been, it's just the common practice. It's simple and easiest way to make a short-term profit, but has really some severe negative long-term consequences. Another big factor has been fire suppression. You can see from that chart up top there that, you know, a lot of these drier forest types, the oak forest types and the yellow pine forest types, they were burning two, even three times per decade. And this was done by the Native Americans for thousands of years. And then by the early settlers for hundreds of years, kept up that practice. But then in 1910, the federal government realized, oh, that these, forest, these fires could get bad after all that logging and all that slash down, that fires got too extreme. And there were a lot of bad fires that were burning things too much. And they said, okay, let's stop all burning and put out all forest fires. And Smokey Bear came on the scene and they stopped. They forest fires stopped from you know 1910, it dropped by 1950, it was pretty much non-existent. And then we realized, hey, you know, wait a minute, fire actually had a really important role in our forest and it actually was beneficial, was going on. Yes, they can get too severe. If it's done after a, you know, a major timber harvest and there's lots of debris down, but a lot of times it actually improves the forest. So you can see those two pictures there. The top is a control picture that was unburned, and that's a very dense, thick forest, really dense undergrowth, which is not so good to get a diverse mix of regeneration when there's not much sun down there. So only certain shade tolerant trees can survive down there. And it's not very good wildlife habitat either, it turns out. Wildlife like that lower picture a lot better. Burning kind of knocks back that dense undergrowth, forces plants to re-sprout. That fresh new growth is a lot more palatable and nutritious for wildlife to eat, much better browse for all kinds of wildlife. And it also allows a more diverse mix of plants to grow because you get some more sun in there. You can get plants that need sun as well as those that need shade mixing in. So it creates a more diverse, healthy forest as well. So that's been another major factor. We've had fire suppression for 100 years. And just recently, they've started, OK, yeah, we, we need to have fire in the forest. It's a good thing. It actually reduces you know, risks for severe wildfires. And it also improves wildlife habitat. It also helps make the forest healthier. So it's really a, a win across the board to have good controlled burning in the forest uh, and appropriate drier sites. Not everywhere, but on appropriate drier sites, it really is a beneficial thing. So that's been a big change to our forest. We mentioned earlier, you were talking earlier about non-native insects, diseases, and plants. We mentioned the chestnut blight in the 30 and 40 wiped out the American chestnut. We've got the balsam oleodelgid here in the mountains. It's that picture in the top middle. You can see my cursor. Those are all dead Fraser fir trees, which is the signature Christmas tree. 
the best Christmas tree around. They got really decimated back in the 50s and 60s, and they're coming back, but it's still around. It's still really the degrading them. The hemlock woolly adelgid, you're probably familiar with that lower picture in the middle there, those little cottony balls on the underside of the hemlock needles. Those insects are eating the parts of the tree that actually kill the tree. So the hemlocks have probably 90% plus of those have died. That's a whole another species really functionally eliminated. There's some still hanging on. There's some that you can chemically treat, but they're really not a part of the forest anymore. A lot of dead ones standing there you can see on the far left. And then non-native invasive plants like Asiatic bittersweet is probably the greatest threat. Asiatic or oriental bittersweet here. These vines in the lower right-hand corner can grow, as you see, up to five, six inches in diameter. And you can have multiple vines climbing a tree and they can actually kill mature, healthy trees. These vines can climb up over the top of them, shade out the tree and weight it down and eventually kill and topple the tree and then totally take over. I've seen acres of forest that have been completely taken over by this Asiatic bittersweet because it's totally shade tolerant. Everyone knows about kudzu and how horrible kudzu, kudzu is. They can just you know take over. It's the weed that ate the south. But kudzu needs sun, so you'll see it on the edge of the forest. But this bittersweet can grow in the shade in a dense, undisturbed forest. It can take over and destroy a forest that hasn't had any other disturbance to it. So it's really a major threat to forests around here. I know it's across, again, the whole Eastern US. It's a, it's a major problem that is really um, needs to be dealt with before it does start really killing trees and destroying swaths of forest as I've seen it do. So those non-native invasive plants are huge there. And this is not a problem that's gonna stop. Um, the emerald ash borer just got to North Carolina a couple of years ago. It's already killed just about every ash tree in Western North Carolina. I don't know if it's gotten down to the Piedmont yet, but it will. And ash trees down there, if they haven't started dying yet, it kills them in just a year or two and it kills them stone dead really fast. So it's, it's really um, disturbing to see what the emerald ash borer can do. It's another Asian insect that was accidentally imported on shipping pallets, they think. Uh, the gypsy moth, uh, which eats uh, oak trees and oak trees are already in decline. I'll talk more about oaks a lot in the future. They're really important. It's now been detected in North Carolina and it's further weakening and the oaks that are already in decline can't really take too much more. It's probably going to kill some oaks down here. It's done a lot of damage up in New England and it's finally spread down here and it has potential to do a lot of damage down here as well. So the emerald ash borer, this is why you want to have a diverse forest. This is Toledo, Ohio. They wanted their street trees to all match. So they planted ash trees beautifully along their city streets. And it looks fantastic there on the left in June 2006, all those matching symmetrical ash trees. The emerald ash borer came through and three years later, every single one of those ash trees was dead and their streets were lined with dead ash trees. A huge, huge cost. And this has happened for cities all over the Eastern US. Been a huge, huge cost to remove these dead ash trees very expensive to take down a tree in the city and they have to try and plant a new tree to take its place and it takes years or even decades for those trees to grow to the size that these trees were. So this is why you don't want to have a monoculture of just one tree on your streets or in your forest. The more diverse the forest the better because you never know what the next invasive insect or disease that comes in and might wipe out a tree species is um, and you want to be prepared for that to happen the more diverse it is, the better your forest can handle and mitigate that and be more resilient and adapting to these future changes that we don't know what's going to happen exactly with things like climate change or these invasive insects. But that's a real stark picture there about there is, you know, this one green tree on that picture on the right. And that tree is not an ash tree. There is one non-ash tree on that street and it's the only surviving one. So really stark picture there. In the Piedmont, the problem actually is the southern pine beetle is probably the biggest problem you have right now. And this attacks and only will kill stressed out pine trees. And this is one of the problems with these dense pine plantations is they intentionally plant them overly dense and they really need to be thinned after about 10 or 20 years where they start to compete and that, that competition weakens the trees and a weakened tree, this is actually a native Pest. The southern pine beetle is native and it only attacks weakened trees. But because we have, again, thousands of acres of these pure stands of loblolly pine trees, it's, they're everywhere. They can find them and a lot of them are not managed properly and get weakened. 
And you can see in this picture here is the pine trees on the upper areas that have died, the brown areas, and it, they then radiate outward once they get established, they then spread out and start attacking healthy trees. When they get in really high numbers, they can actually then start killing healthy trees. And the only way to treat this is to go in there and cut down all of those trees that have already been infested um, to stop them from spreading. So you have to do what's called a salvage cut when they're in cut that whole area or they'll just keep spreading. And especially if trees are stressed by drought or being again, densely overplanted and not properly managed, not thinned out when they needed to be thinned out, it can really do a number um, on these pine stands that, that need this. And this pops up, it's, it's sporadic. Every 10 years or so, it'll have a boom in population and cause some problems. And then it will kind of go away for 10 years and it'll boom again. Um, so it'll happen again in just a matter of when. Prepare for that. So I um, want to talk about forest structure and composition. These are both really important concepts for um, ecological forestry. So, I mean, the forest, this is a picture of the mountain, and it looks beautiful. It's just, you know, it looks like forests go on, really have, you know, over a million acres, almost two million acres of public forests around here. You know, a million acres in national forests in Western North Carolina, half a million acres in the Smoky Mountains. It's a beautiful forest, but all of this, even the national park, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, 75% of the national park was clear cut. And it looks, it's grown back and looks pretty good, but it's grown back in a very even aged, middle aged, almost all the forests are between 60 to maybe 100 years old. So it's a very even aged, flat canopy. You don't have a lot of structural diversity in the forest. And because the plants are, the trees are all about the same size, a very even canopy, they kind of shelter each other. So we don't get disturbances that go on. It used to be wind and ice and fire would come in and kill some trees. And it was somewhere around a half, maybe 2% of the forest would be naturally, if you owned, a, looked at 100 acres, every year, an acre or two would actually fall down. There'd be a wind or an ice storm, and there'd be some gaps in there that would happen. And these kind of gaps aren't happening in the forest naturally much anymore because it's just too young. You're not hitting those big old trees that would break down or fall down in these storms. So it's, it's not having the disturbance going on. It's changing the composition because of the structure of the forest is changing its composition. And this is true in the Piedmont too, by the way. Um, a lot of the forests are, are very even aged, uh, at least the, nat the native hardwood forests. The pine plantations are very different. They're managed very intensely, but the, the natural native hardwood forests in the Piedmont have the exact same issue. Um, you have a very intact closed canopy, very little sun getting through to the forest floor, which means only shade tolerant trees like maples and birches and sourwood and heath, which is rhododendron and, and mountain laurel in the mountains have really expanded and those trees have greatly exploded in the understory because they're the only ones that can tolerate that dense shade. It's also much more humid down there, much more moist in the shady. We're not getting sun to dry things out. In the Piedmont, it's maple and sweet gum and holly uh, are the trees that kind of take over in the understory. And we're not getting especially the oaks and the hickories, which were really the keystone species for wild. That was kind of the fundamental forest that wildlife were thriving on. And to really reduce the wildlife um, has a potential to reduce the wildlife populations greatly from that. And we'll talk more about that. So we have a, a lack of structural diversity in the forest, which is also leading to less species diversity in the forest. And both those things, the structural and species diversity of the forest directly impact the diversity of wildlife in the forest. The number of wildlife species that use a forest is correlated to the number of tree species and the different structures in the forest because different Species need different structures, different ages of trees, even at different life cycles, the same species of wildlife can need different structures of forest. It might need a very young forest to hide their young chicks and, and broods in, but they might need a mature forest to nest in later. Um, so it's a very different thing, need all of these here. And so this, this is a term, the oak bottleneck. And this is happening all over the Eastern US. If you look in the overstory, so on the right-hand side here are bigger trees, and there are lots of big oaks. The orange are the oaks. There are lots of big oaks in the overstory. There are hickories in the overstory. There are other trees. There are some maples in the overstory. There are some tulip poplars or yellow poplar trees in the overstory. But when you go down to the mid-story area here, it is almost all taken over by other species, like I mentioned, like sourwood or sweet gum in the Piedmont, shade-tolerant trees. Maple is really dominating the mid-stories. And oaks are not in the midstory of the tree. There are some little bitty oaks over here at the far left, the orange. There are some little bitty oaks, 
but they aren't getting enough sun, so they slowly die out and they aren't maturing. But the shade tolerant trees, the maples, and like I mentioned, the sourwoods and the birches and beeches and other things really take over in the midstory. And those are the trees that are now then starting to take over the overstory as these oaks and hickories that are between six to 100 years old start to begin to die out and they taper off, they are not being replaced. They're being replaced by a less diverse and a less valuable for wildlife forest and actually, actually less valuable timber wise too. Oak is a very valuable timber tree, whereas maple is not very valuable timber tree. So there's really a shift Oaks are declining. There's a lot of oaks that are out there now, mature oaks that are slowly declining and dying off, and they are not being replaced. And this is essential because oak is the keystone species for wildlife out there. Acorns are essential. And also over 500 species of insects live on oak trees. Oaks support a tremendous diversity and, and a tremendous population of insects. And those insects bring in the birds and the little critters to eat the insects. And that brings in the bigger critters. So it's really the basis for the whole food chain in the forest is oaks and their acorns. And of course, a lot of animals, everything from birds to bears eats the acorns directly too. It's an incredibly nutritious food source in the woods. So those are being lost slowly. We need to take some actions to try and restore oaks and get oaks to be in our future forest too. And I'll talk about how to do that coming up soon. Another picture, this is showing again, just quickly. A lot of the forests are in this middle age class here. These, these one of the, this is the 60 to 80 to 100 year old trees. And there are oaks in this class, all kinds of different oaks. And it's good to have a mixture of diversity of oaks, white oaks and black oaks and red oaks. They're all good to have those mix of different oaks in there, but they are not regenerating. And the smaller, younger size classes, they just are not the oaks coming along to replace these older oaks as they begin to die. So we need to take some actions to keep these oaks that are essential for wildlife in our oak dominated forests. Um, so the other thing is the structural diversity of our forests. So this is kind of the natural succession a forest goes through. If there's been a disturbance, a clearing, whether it's a clear cut or a storm goes through, what will happen initially is literally tens of thousands of trees per acre will seed in and germinate. And you'll get lots and lots of little trees growing and they'll compete and 90% of them die. But eventually you'll, the ones that compete will form a young forest, the stem exclusion. There's still a lot of competition and there can be still thousands of trees per acre. They'll compete. And again, probably 90% of those trees will die. And you're left with maybe a couple hundred trees per acre. And this is where the forest has now established its composition. Um, and then ideally, if you can wait hundreds of years, you'll get old growth forest. Which will have, they'll have some really big trees, but not all the trees are really big because as some of the really big old trees die, it opens up space for little young trees to grow and medium-sized trees and, and kind of big trees. You get a whole, an old growth forest is not just all big trees. There's some big trees, but it's also medium-sized and small trees and a whole wide diversity of tree sizes and also a mixture of tree species. And the problem we're having now is that again, about 80% of our forests are in this middle age stage of life. There's very little old growth left. It was all cut hundred years ago. What's left of it should be left and preserved. That's very important for wildlife. It's a very good, rich, diverse habitat, great for wildlife and lots of other things. But a lot of wildlife also needs young forests. And we have very little young forests now going out. That used to be maybe about five to 10% of our forests were young forests. And now it's only literally one or 2%. There's a lot of species out there from things like the golden winged warbler, but also things like turkey and grouse and quail. A lot of the game bird species need young forest habitat. That's where their insects are on the ground. Their young can go and hide and forage and get those high protein insects in a young forest. Um, but they also need other forests around. So we need to diversify our forest structure, encourage some forests to be more old growth and also do some kind of intentional disturbance at appropriate places at appropriate scales to create more young forest out there. That's a really important thing as well. Um, so those are two things here. So I'm gonna stop for a minute. I'm about halfway through and give you a chance to ask any questions on things that have come up so far. And there's my contact information. If you want to email me or call me later, I'm happy to take questions. So I'll turn it over for folks to ask questions for a minute here. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Um, we do have a few questions here in the chat. And so John is asking, are any towns or states implementing restrictions on unwise development that is maybe happening too close to forests? 
The short answer to that is no. Uh, North Carolina and the U.S. are very strong property rights places where landowners have property rights to do what they want with their private property. So the short answer is no, there's not. There are some conservation organizations that are working to try and conserve more land strategically in areas that are near large forest blocks to get that landscape connectivity and try and have wildlife corridors between the big forest blocks that exist. So there, there is some work being done, um, but it's voluntary work by nonprofit conservation and land trust groups to try and do that. But there's no, unfortunately, the government does fund that somewhat, but there's no direct government laws or policies really guiding that. Unfortunately, people can, can build wherever they want on the private land they own. Gotcha, thanks for elaborating on that. Um, Monty is asking, how was the Asiatic bittersweet first introduced? Yeah, no one knows exactly, but um, one theory is it might have been introduced at the Biltmore Estates here in Asheville. You know, people really wanted these Asian plants. It's, you know, they're very exotic. It produces lots and lots of these bright red berries in the winter. People use it for Christmas wreaths. So it, it had some, you know, it was very exotic and it had some really good aesthetic qualities for ornamentals. So in the fact that it produced lots of berries made it very pretty. The fact that it produced lots of berries also made it so that it, it reproduces those berries or seeds too. And the birds eat it and spread the seeds everywhere and it quickly, it spread much faster. There actually is a Native American bittersweet too. And the Native American bittersweet actually is a more nutritious fruit for the birds, but it doesn't produce as many of them. So it also doesn't reproduce as fast. So it, it actually, and they're actually interbreeding now in the Native American bittersweet uh, may, be, may be diluted from the gene, may actually cease to exist in the wild because there's so much more of the Asiatic bittersweet now. So yeah, almost all of these non-native invasive plants were intentionally introduced um, as ornamentals or for erosion control because they grew so fast like kudzu um, and they've all now escaped out of control. And they don't, they don't have the native controls they had in their native environment. There were insects or fungus or diseases that kind of kept them in check and they're over here and they don't have the, we don't have those insects or those diseases or those funguses that were controlling these plants and keeping them from growing out of control which is what they're doing here. And so they're trying to look at maybe reintroducing some of those native controls here, but that also then you're bringing over more non-native organisms to try and it's a tricky question to get on there. So yeah, good question. Next one. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, invasives are always a fun topic. <laughs> yeah. um, we also have a question from John asking, um, is Asian longhorn beetles still a threat to trees in the United States? It definitely is. Asian longhorn beetle has not been found here in North Carolina yet, not even in the Southern Appalachian area, but yeah, it, um, it kills maple trees and it has attacked in Massachusetts and it, it kills them right away, almost immediately. Um, the good news about Asian longhorn beetle is when it, it kills a tree so quickly, it's quick, easy to notice it and they can go in there and again, cut down those trees and chip them up and kill the beetle. So it doesn't, it's pretty easy to tell where it's been and to get on it quickly. And they actually have a program there where you, they can actually go into private land and say, oh, you've got this on your private land. We have to cut this tree down and chip it up to kill the beetle before it spreads. So they've been, they've been pretty successful so far in controlling the Asian longhorn beetle, but it does pop up. It's still popping up here and there. Um, they're still, I have never, they, you, you unfortunately cannot really ever truly eradicate these things. They're always gonna be around at some low level. And then eventually the populations will boom and they'll do some real damage. Uh, and then they can detect it and stop it. But it, um, yeah, it still it still is a threat, and it, it'll probably it'll probably get here at some point in time too. To be honest, and that would devastate the maple trees in areas where it pops up. Awesome, thanks. Um, and then Bob and Reagan are asking: Does North Carolina have a Forest Best Practices Act, and is that enforced? Yeah, again, the, the same thing is, no, they don't. The state, again, there's property rights. You can do whatever you want. The only thing the state mandates uh, for forestry practices is best management practices. The only thing the state is allowed to enforce is water quality violations. If you do something that causes erosion or pollution to enter a stream, they can then enforce that and make you stop that and actually you know, fine you for that. But beyond that, um, you can do whatever you want. You and this is a big problem that someone has invasive plants and they want to do a timber sale, they can do a timber sale and cut down their native trees 
and the native invasive plants then completely take over and the native trees cannot come back because the invasives will totally take over the forest and I've seen that happen. And unfortunately there's, yeah, there's no private landowners have, have property rights to do what they want with their property. And there's, if you wanted to plant non-native invasive plants, you could plant them, you know, and, and people have done that. Actually, that's a lot of them have got, that's how they got there where they were. People actually intentionally planted them a lot of places, yeah. Um, kind of a follow-up question with that is, are cities um, planting native trees in their urban areas? Are you seeing more of that? Yes, definitely. There's been a lot of talk about that. Um, Asheville in particular, I know I'm most familiar with, but I know other trees have, cities have done that. They've realized that urban trees are incredibly valuable. They give you, especially for deciduous trees, they give you shade in the summer. So it makes you cooler, reduces your cooling bills and the leaves fall off in the winter. And it, so it doesn't keep you cooler in the winter. It, allows you to stay warm in the winter. So it really is a beneficial, it's also all kinds of benefits to, you know, makes people feel more at ease and happier and, you know, calmer, have trees around. It's a tremendous benefit. So cities have realized this and they're investing in planting trees. The problem is mostly finding the space to plant the trees and it's a cost too to plant trees in the city. And it does require, you can't just plant a tree and walk away. You do have to maintain the tree in the city, especially mulch it or water it or it might have more, more health problems in the city. It's not as good an environment for trees. So only certain trees are really tough enough to take the city environment sometimes. So it's being done, um, but there are some challenges. But yeah, a lot of cities are doing that. I think the yeah. question might have been around, uh, are they planting native trees? Yeah, oh, yes, them. yes. Yeah, definitely. They are planting native trees. All, all, all public places, public lands have realized that they, they do not they cannot plant non-native invasive plants anymore that did a lot of damage doing that in the past. And so now they're only planting native trees. I'm, I'm sure that's the policy of every public agency, whether it's a city, a state or federal agency, they only will plant native trees now. Yeah. Awesome, that's, that's good to hear. Um, and John, I saw you sent a question directly to Andy, but I don't think, Andy, you can't see the chat box, can you right now? I can. I can pull it up here on my screen. Um, was there? I think Would... John sent you one directly. Yeah, it had to do with, you know, the question was, does your organization, especially now where there's a lot of really important environmental legislation pending in Congress, mm -hmm. does your organization get involved in any of that? Yeah, the, the one area that we've been a little involved in that, um, the one area in particular is with the national forest planning process. Um, so the national forest, the U.S. Forest Service has creating a new plan for the national forest in North Carolina. And we have been involved in that process heavily for the past literally 13 years uh, that's been going on. Um, even before we were, we were started, we had some staff that were doing it on their own are now, now paid staff doing that. Um, we haven't gotten too much involved in any political campaigns and a little bit locally with Asheville in terms of encouraging the city to adapt a, uh, a tree ordinance here and to limit um, if someone does want to develop land in the city, they either have to try and maintain a certain number of the trees in the property or they have to plant new trees on that property or somewhere else in the city. They have to make sure they're offsetting. Uh, if they're clearing trees from a development site, they have to, and we, we were part of encouraging that. We weren't the leaders in it by any means, but we did, we were supportive of that. So we do play a support role locally in some issues. We have not gotten involved at the state or federal level. We're just based in Asheville. We're a pretty small nonprofit. We only have six or seven kind of permanent year round staff that work in the office here. Um, so we've, we've stuck with local issues on that. Yeah, yeah I know that uh, both senators in North Carolina have sponsored, uh, I forget the name of the legislation. It has to do with bringing back wildlife. I was just wondering whether you, you know, had any involvement with that. We haven't got anything at the state or federal level now. We haven't done that yet. Um, hopefully sometime in the future, when we get big enough, we'll get involved in, in the state and, and federal. Right now, we're just stick, sticking locally with things. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Um, we'll just do one more and then we'll save the rest for the end so that you have a chance to finish your presentation. Um, so I'll just go with, um, Jennifer's asking, what does it, what does a registered forester mean? Yeah, great, great question. I should have talked. Yeah, so it's a couple of things. One, you have to have a degree in forestry or the equivalent educational background. You have to apply for the, to the state board of registered foresters. Um, 
You have to take a full day long exam to prove that you know everything a forester should know, you should have learned. And you have to get you know five references from other registered foresters in the state that say you're going to be an upstanding, do good work, do sustainable forestry only, and and be a you know do good work and improve our forests. And then you have to take an oath that you're going to serve uh, your clients, but you'll always do sustainable forestry. You won't do anything that is unsustainable or degrades the forest for it there. So it is it's a legal process you have to go through to ensure that you have someone who has proper training and the proper ethics to do good forestry. Because a lot of times it's easy for a forester to, for someone that wanted to do just timber harvesting to just do that high grade and that's the easy way to make money, but our, no registered forester should ever do that or recommend that. It is not a sustainable practice. But if you're just doing it for money, you could do that. If ethics weren't a consideration or, or good forestry wasn't a consideration, that could happen. That's why that's a real important difference between a logger or a, or a timber buyer. They are not registered foresters. They are trying to buy and cut timber and sell it to the mill to make money, which is a different practice. That's why it's really, really important if you're doing a timber sale that you do get a registered forester involved to make sure they oversee your interests and in making sure your forest is managed sustainably, harvested sustainably, and it will come back. And also to make sure you're getting paid a fair price for your timber. Even though you'd have to, you have to pay a forester to oversee the timber sale, you will usually make more profit in the end, even after paying the forester, because the forester knows the value of your trees and will make sure you get paid a fair price. So even though you have to pay the forester, you'll still make more money in the end by having the getting a good value for your trees and having it be sustainable so you can harvest again in the future. Yeah, excellent question. Thank you for that. Awesome. Yeah, we'll hold all the rest of the questions till the end just so you have a chance to finish um, your presentation. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks. I can be a little long winded. I'll try and move along quickly here on things, but um, let me get into, so the common challenge, what are the problems with good forestry? And the number one challenge is simple money. A lot of people want to do good forestry, but it costs money to control non-native invasive plants. It costs money to do what they call forest stand improvement work, where you're just doing some work to improve the forest, but you're not actually harvesting valuable trees. You might be cutting down some of the un less valuable trees to make it better. Um, so it costs money to do good forestry. It's really hard to make it pay. There is funding available, though. There are, there are streams of federal money and other sources of money you can do to get money. Other we talked about is the other problem is non-native invasive plants. This picture at the bottom left shows the two biggest problems, Asiatic bittersweet. That vine is completely, it's all, just because it's green is not healthy. As a matter of fact, sometimes the denser and thicker the green is, the less healthy the forest is. All of that green you're seeing growing over the tops of those trees and it's growing up over, that's the Asiatic bittersweet vine. It'll just grow right over the top of a tree and kill it. And the other thing is this tree of heaven, which is the most ironic name should be called the tree of hell, um, is one of the other worst invasives where it can take over and actually emits a chemical that inhibits other plants from growing. And it'll take over literally acres of a forest and prevent the native trees from growing there. And it has no value timber-wise. It's actually poisonous. Um, um, so it's just a horrible, horrible plant that is taking over and that's causing problems in the Piedmont as well as the mountains. Um, they really have to control those to do anything good in the forest first. Uh, climate change uh, is changing what trees are going to be best adapted to be in the forests, and we need to help manage our forest there as sometimes the trees that are around may not be the best trees for climate change as we get more extreme weather. Um, and I talked about we have less diverse forests now because we've lost a number of species and we've replanted a very, very few species have been planted intentionally and also very less structural diversity. We have generally a lot of middle-aged forests, not a lot of very young forests, not a lot of very old forests. And the last thing is the stand on the right here is a stand that's been high graded. And they've taken out all the valuable trees. They left behind you know, some small trees, but there's no value here now in this forest. There's no future value. These trees are not gonna get, be big, strong trees. They just they didn't evolve. They weren't, th these are the ones that were losing out in competition. So there's really no value here. Because one thing, one way you can fund forest improvement is you can do a timber sale and take the profits to do some work to control your invasives and improve your forest with the profits from a timber sale. But if you've had the forest high graded, then you don't have any value there to even do a timber sale to get some money to invest in your forest. So there's major challenges on the forest to address. So what do we do about this? And this is one of the main services we provide is to help people make a plan for the forest. 
go out there and assess the forest. What are your objectives? What do you want from your forest? Is it wildlife and water quality and aesthetics and recreation? Or is it timber value? Or is it if you want to do, you know, mushrooms and ginseng? What are the things you want to do in your forest? And make a plan. You can have a plan to get you to where you want to be. Um, we can write a plan to do that. The biggest challenge is it to actually implement the plan. And that's that's where the, the money challenge comes in sometimes. It can be hard to implement the plan fully. And then you have to monitor and adapt as needed because you know forestry is is a science, but it's also an art to it sometimes. So it's kind of tricky. But that's, a plan is the first place to start there. Um, and the, for your plan, the key is we talk about ecologically beneficial forestry is to take whatever the forest is at now and try and improve it. Sustainable forestry is just not going to get any worse, but ecological forestry is looking at you to improve and restore the forests to make them better and bigger than they were in the past. And look at all these things they talked about here, whether it's, you know, special rare threat and endangered species on your property, water quality, biodiversity, wildlife, carbon sequestration is becoming really important now. The aesthetics, recreation, you mentioned, you know, other things, in the, lots of other things in the forest, mushrooms and ginseng. And it, you, you can do this. And you can do a timber harvest that respects all these values and still is profitable on there. You may not maximize your short-term profit, but you can do a profitable timber harvest and still improve wildlife habitat and keep the water quality good and be biodiverse. So, you know, a healthy forest, again, is diverse in terms of a lot of different species and a lot of different sizes of trees also. Both those things got to go on. And it has to be vigorously growing. That's well, it's important that the high grading stop and that we don't just cut all the biggest trees, which were the most vigorous ones, and leave the ones that weren't vigorous. You want those really healthy, vibrant trees to be the ones you leave behind. It's more resistant to stress, it's better wildlife habitat, and it sequesters more carbon to keep a diverse forest that's growing vigorously. It's also better for soil and water quality, and it just looks better. Um, and you can make money in doing, you can have a healthy forest, and you can make money or you could, if you want to, just do enough harvesting to break even if you wanted to, or you could make money and reinvest it in your forest, or you could have some income off your forest and still manage these things and do it well. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. So I've talked about a lot of the historic problems. There's lots of problems we've had with our past management. We have forests now that are less diverse and of lower quality and less structural diversity. So we have this past, we can't change the past, but we can make a plan to change the future. What is the desired future condition? We can make a plan to get there and we can do some silviculture, which is management of forests to make the forest more diverse, more valuable, higher quality, better wildlife habitat, all these things. We can do some management to undo the damage. And if we don't do anything, unfortunately, things are probably going to continue to get worse. If you don't control invasive plants, they're going to get worse. And you know, climate change is going to make things more challenging in the forest, but you can do some things to make the forest better adapted to that. Um, so things need to be done now in the forest. We can't just leave it alone. My, my dad said he used to manage by benign neglect. He would just leave, you know, he had a couple acres of forest. He would just leave it alone. Well, that's, that's not working anymore um, because of the because of fire suppression and the changing structure of our forest and invasive species. Leaving it alone is not helping things anymore, unfortunately. Um, it's really important to monitor go back out to your forest at least once every 10 years and see what you did and see how it's working and see if you need to adjust and adapt because it's a very complex thing out there, but just a fancy map showing that. Uh, this is a much more important picture. The first step in doing ecological forestry, trying to do restoration forestry or conservation forestry is to look at the landscape, the property you're working on. This is a map, one of our client's property and decide which areas do you not want to disturb that are in good natural shape and leave those areas alone. Have some reserve areas. The areas in dark blue are all reserve areas. A lot of that is along the streams and you shouldn't do much disturbance near a stream you wanna protect water quality. So set aside those areas, limit disturbance around the streams, protect the water quality. And there actually were a couple areas up here that were actually were some little old growth, some really nice, healthy, natural forests that are almost old growth. And those areas should be left, even though there's good timber value there, some of those areas need to be left and preserved as left as some preservation areas. So figure out what areas you don't want to disturb and then look for areas where you could do some good management. So you're going to leave some areas alone if they're in good shape, they don't have invasive species, but other areas, the red areas were the south and west facing slopes where it was a very dry and fire adapted community that really needs fire to clear out the understory. Those areas would benefit from having a controlled burn in those areas. So you can, you can restore burning to the higher, drier areas 
the oak and the yellow pine forests that actually benefit. Those species of trees actually are fire adapted and even sometimes even fire dependent. So fire can be used there. And then you can look at areas where, you know, the dark green areas are where there is timber value and you could do some timber harvesting and make some money to invest in areas. The light green areas have some timber value, you could do some work there. And the gray areas are areas that don't have much timber value, but you could take some profit off your timber value, off the timber you do harvest it as value and reinvest in improving those forests that don't currently have value, so they will have value in the future. So it's looking at kind of figuring out where is it appropriate to do what. The key to ecological forestry is, you know, what are you going to do, where are you going to do it, how are you going to do it, um, and making sure that that fits appropriately on there. So that's really the key thing here for that in forestry. And then once you have a plan, go ahead and implement it. Map out the property, map out the roads, it's very important. The biggest impact from timber harvesting and from any kind of forest management is the ground soil disturbance. You wanna minimize soil disturbance. So make sure the roads are minimal. If you have roads used there, river crossings are very important to use there. And we go in the woods and we actually will mark which trees we think should be harvested, which trees should be left um, in a timber harvest. And here's a good example in the lower left-hand corner is a picture of a, of a, a stand of trees here. So I don't know if we can do an online poll here, but which of these trees do you think is the oldest? This one on the far left here, if you can see my cursor, this uh, little one in the middle or this tree on the far right here. Which of those trees do you think is the oldest? Just think for yourself for a minute. And almost everyone will say, oh, it's this tree here on the left. The biggest tree is the oldest. Well, this actually is a pine plantation. These trees were all planted on the exact same day. They are the exact same age. Some of them just grew faster because they had either better genetics or they got a little bit of a head start and they got the sun and shaded out the smaller ones or they had better nutrients in the soil right around them. They had a little more moisture or something. And the trees that just didn't grow very well just lost out in competition, may even be dead. So this is the key thing here. The trees are all the same age. The, if you harvest just the biggest trees, you're also taking the best trees. And these trees that are left behind are not gonna grow well in the future. They're not good high quality trees. If you left this forest alone, the smaller trees would probably die because they're not healthy, vigorous trees. You wanna make sure you leave some vigorous trees and harvest some of the less vigorous trees, which unfortunately is the opposite of how you make money on things. That's the rub there. But do a good plan to figure out how you can minimize your ground disturbance, minimize your soil disturbance, but still do some good forestry out there on, on your land is the key thing here. And then we can make a plan talked about, you could do controlled burns, you could do thinning. You don't have to do clear cutting, you could do thinnings, a great option to do where you're leaving a pretty much intact forest behind. You could do group selections where you may harvest an acre or two of trees. It's like a mini patch, a mini clear cut, but it's just an acre or two. And that's really mimicking a natural disturbance. That's what would happen in nature. A tree, a big tree would fall down and maybe take out an acre of an area. And then there you have young trees coming up, but rather than wait for that tree to fall down, we'll harvest a couple of those big trees and, and the smaller trees and the less valuable and the less desirable trees in the area to let it reset and have competition happen in that group and get a healthy forest coming in there and introduce that structural diversity to the forest. So you have some young areas that were cleared and allowed to regrow with then mature forest around them. And you can do other things to improve your forest control invasives, do a crop tree release to help the more desired trees you have. Maybe you have some rare plants you could have a botanist come in and look at. This is what a plan looks like. This is the summary of a plan, what it looks like we would do on your forest. All the recommendations of things that could be done for things. Some of which would be optional and some of which would be uh, required if you wanna get a tax break for your property. If the PUV program is a major tax savings, um, you can get, if you manage your forest sustainably for timber. So, couple examples, oak forest. I talked a lot about oak restoration is really important and really needed. So option one is if you do nothing, if there's no treatment done to an oak forest, what is happening to oak forest is they are transitioning and oaks are not regenerating. Oaks are, are being lost and maples and birches and beeches and sourwoods and sweet gums and hollies are taking over. And as the oaks die, those trees will take over the forest and our oak forest will be greatly diminished. And that will be a great cost to us for wildlife, for one thing. Wildlife really rely on oak. Um, so doing nothing, again, neglect, benign neglect is not benign anymore. It, it's just neglect. Doing nothing is a choice, a management action that in these oak forests, in most cases, is not going to keep the oak there. It's going to 
result, doing nothing is going to result in the loss of oak. So that's an important realization to have. However, if you cut in some of those gaps I talked about, anywhere from a half to two acre in size, to create some openings and get some more sun in there for the oaks to grow, you can do some things that will encourage oaks to grow. So as the mature oaks start to naturally die, there will be young oaks to take in, but it will take action to get some sun down there. Um, or you can do burning. Burning benefits oaks. You can do regular burning. And it needs to be like every three to seven years to go through with low intensity controlled ground fires. Again, to clear out the understory, get some more sun there so the little oaks can grow and have a chance to then compete and be in the future. So it takes some action. Doing nothing is not good for oaks. Doing some good timber harvesting, but it has to be done well by, again, this is where you need a well-trained, well, um, someone who really knows their stuff, a good forester to come in and help you figure out how to keep your oaks regenerating so you will have a future oak forest. Um, and fire is kind of controversial, but that can restore a lot of the oaks that are out there. These oak woodlands were very common with fire. The other big thing that um, pine plantations, pine plantations, this is traditional forestry for timber production, is to clear cut an area and densely, actually to clear cut an area and then spray herbicides to kill any of the native plants or not, kill any other plants that were growing and then replant nothing but pine trees that grow fast so you'll have another crop of timber sooner. But they, they plant them intensely, intentionally densely so they'll grow vertically and grow very straight and tall, which is good timber. But people don't realize that you have to manage these. You have to go in in 10 or 20 years and thin out half of the pine trees that are competing. They're not gonna grow well unless you do thin them out after they've grown for 10 or 20 years. That's traditional management. That's not what I like to do. I like to have a natural mixed forest, which is much healthier and much better for wildlife. And actually, I believe it's actually a better investment because if you have a stand of all pine trees, well, if the market for pine trees is good and you don't have the southern pine beetle come in and kill them, yeah, you'll get a good return on your investment. But if the markets change and pine trees aren't valuable in the future, because there's too many of them, which has happened recently, and the price goes down, it actually is less valuable to have that pine plantation, which was intentionally planted. It would have been better to let the stand naturally regenerate into a mixed natural forest if the prices for those trees are better. So it's kind of like it's like a, a, a stock portfolio also having a diverse mix of stocks. One stock might go way down, but the other stocks will do OK. If you got a pine plantation, you only have one stock in your forest and that actually might lose value. But a mixed forest is going to have better resiliency to market changes, too, and can actually be worth more economically. And it's definitely worth more ecologically in terms of diverse forest for for plants, for animals. And I would say even aesthetically. Nice to have a mixture of things to see. Um, so a couple of options, I think we've done here. Uh, one is to, in these uh, yellow pine, these dry oak pine forests, shortleaf pine used to be probably million, a couple million acres across the Piedmont was shortleaf pine. And it was all cleared and has not come back because shortleaf pine is fire dependent. It needs fire to persist. And this was a very important tree for wildlife. They used to talk about the early settlers could ride their horses three abreast through these open woodlands that were regularly burned. Nowadays, the woods are very dense and thick, and it's hard to even walk through them, never mind ride a horse through them. Um, and these open forests were actually better for wild Having this as a component, this, this component missing has taken away a, a totally different wildlife habitat that doesn't exist anymore. So trying to restore some of these open oak and pine woodlands that were regularly burned were very open that included things like shortleaf pine, which is the shortleaf pine is greatly decreased along with the oaks because of the fire suppression. So putting fire back in there, harvesting out some of the common trees that are there, things like white pine is very common in the mountains, getting rid of some of the common trees that aren't as good for wildlife and that are very common and trying to restore some of the less common trees like the yellow pine shortleaf pines and the pitch pines or the yellow pines um, and the oaks need some help to restore them and fire is one way to do that as well as timber harvesting can actually speed up that process too leaving behind the less common trees that you want to favor and then harvesting out some of the more common trees that are doing fine and uh, giving more space for the less common and more desirable trees um, another thing we do is thinning 
And this is a way you actually can kind of can push a forest closer to being old growth faster. So in most natural forests, there's a lot of trees on the left and they're competing. Because they're competing heavily, they aren't growing as fast. So you can do a thinning on the right-hand side here and take out some of those trees. You still leave an intact forest behind, but now the trees have more space to grow and they can grow bigger faster. So it will kind of create an old growth structure more quickly by doing this. And you can also make it more diverse. Again, you can harvest the more common trees. Yellow poplars are very common around here. You can harvest out some of the poplars, leave, there's oaks in there, leave those, and create a more diverse forest that will grow bigger faster and become more like the old growth that's been missing and taken out of our forests. Um, another option to do here is a shelter wood treatment. In an oak forest, you can go in and kind of do a little bit of the reverse of a high grade and leave, leave some really nice big oak trees, leave the best trees and take out the rest. Take out, you have to take out some of the big trees to make some value, to make some earn some profit, but take out all those smaller trees that are were not competing well, that were suppressed and were not going to be good quality trees. Cut those down and clear out space so new young trees can come up. You keep the oaks there. So you keep the acorns, you keep all the insects, those oaks support, you keep good wildlife habitat, you have a seed source for future oaks to grow. This is one way to sustainably manage oaks. You got to leave at least some of the nice big oaks there to be the genetics and the mother trees to the future oak forest, but you also have to create space at the same time for those little oaks to grow. And that's one way of doing it here. And it looks really beautiful. It kind of looks like park-like and you'll get good big growth in that. Um, you can also do what's called a crop tree release. This is in a younger forest. You go in there and you can cut down some of the less valuable, less desirable, some of the, you know, the trees, again, the smaller trees that didn't have value, just cut them down. It costs money to do this. Or you can even use herbicide here. In the right-hand picture, you see some of these trees that had been dead. They've been killed with herbicide to provide more room for the other trees that are more desirable, particularly oaks, need that help. They're not going to compete well with these faster growing things like poplars, or maples in the shade. So you have to do some things to choose which trees that will make your forest more diverse, more healthy, better for wildlife. Um, and you can do some work on young forests to make them grow up that way. Another thing I mentioned is fire. Um, again, this is actually, this is uh, all from the Nature Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy is one of the leaders in doing this and doing these controlled burns. And you see it's a low intensity ground fire here. It's not scorching and killing the mature trees, survive it. It kills some of the smaller, younger trees doesn't look great afterwards, it's all charred, but the next growing season, you'll see lots of fresh growth coming up, lots of little wildflowers and grasses, and it's a really a whole different habitat type that has been missing for 100 years. We're trying to restore, this is the open oak woodland we're talking about here, where you could ride your horses through, through your breast. This is what the settlers came, found when they came through here 200 years ago, through across all of the Piedmont pretty much the Native Americans had been burning it and keeping it open because they realized it was really good for wildlife. A lot of fresh growth for the wildlife to browse on. Um, you know, birds could fly through it easier. It was just a great thing. They could see through it and travel through it easier too. So it's really a beneficial thing for a lot of areas to restore this, especially to those, not everywhere, but to those drier oak areas and those yellow pine areas. And there actually are a lot of uh, rare plants that actually are, again, are fire dependent that need fire to regenerate. They, they won't release their seeds until there is a fire. That really is something that some plants actually need and a number of plants benefit from. And those plants that benefit from fire have greatly decreased. So we need to kind of restore that. I really have gone late here. So this is the last slide here. If you want a healthy forest, you gotta control your invasives. You gotta stop erosion. Um, if you don't do anything, forests are not on a good trajectory. If left alone, they're not gonna get better by themselves. Because of human influences, forests are at risk and at threat. And now humans need to have a positive impact to restore the forest, to get them back on track. Um, and there's lots of programs you can do to get costs. You can, the USDA, NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service actually has funding that will pay people, at least cost share funding, to pay at least part of the cost of doing any of these things, controlling invasive species, doing controlled burns, doing a crop tree release, maintaining unique habitats, restoring streams, planting trees. There actually is free money to help people do these things. Um, so there's help out there. Forest carbon, I won't talk about. It's a whole other big deal. It's just starting to be a thing here. It's, it's controversial. It's pretty complicated. If you want to know more about forest carbon, uh, email me. I can pay more about it. It's, it's a longer discussion than I have time for. 
Last slide, I just, this is a really cool slide. This is uh, the mountains. There are at least 12 different distinct major forest types in the mountains. Every forest type that occurs from Asheville all the way to Canada occurs in the mountains here because the elevation, as you up in elevation, you get cooler and cooler things. We have tremendously diverse forests here in Western North Carolina, in the mountains, you have a hundred different tree species. The Piedmont's still pretty diverse, um, but that's just a really cool slide to show you the great diversity of forests we have here. And I've talked for a long time, I've gone over, I apologize. If you wanna stick around for questions, I'm happy to stick around. Awesome, thank you so much, Andy. This has been so informative and there are a few more questions here in the chat that I'll read off to you. Let me go back up. Um, so I think this was a question that came up when you were first um, discussing the longhorn beetle, but um, Bob and Reagan are asking when trees are chipped, where do the chips go and doesn't that maybe aid in the spread of insects? Yeah, yeah, great question. Insects. Great question. And they've studied the, the Asian longhorn beetle needs a live tree to live in. So chipping it up often will kill the beetle, but it takes away the, that's where their, their young brood inside the tree. So they need the tree to be the host for their young. To chip up the tree, that's where the eggs have been laid. The eggs cannot mature. They, the eggs need to hatch and they actually eat out the under, underneath, right underneath the bark. They girdle the tree, chew the cambium and kill the tree. So if you chip up the tree, the tree, the, the young will die, the eggs will die. They will not reproduce anymore. Yeah, they just leave the chips in the wood usually. And that's, that's fine, that's because the, the eggs will then die. They need the tree as, as, their, as their nesting. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Jake is asking, do you have an equivalent of your position for east of I-95, particularly south of I-40? I really wish we did. We, we hope to maybe someday grow and expand, but at this point in time, we are based in Asheville. Um, we're, we're trying to expand from Asheville and hopefully someday we'll get there, um, but we don't have any. Um, I do, if you wanna contact me individually, there are some people, uh, at least one forester I know of in Raleigh is a good forester. Um, I don't have too many contacts on the coastal plain area, but he might know some people there um, for things, but there are people that do ecological forest. The Forest Stewards Guild is one network uh, I'm part of that is people that are looking at ecological forestry. So if you, if you go to the Forest Guild website, they will list some for I think I'm I think I'm actually the only forester listed in North Carolina, though, on that website. So it's it's yeah, there's there's a need for more people that can do this. And if the demand is there. Um, the supply will materialize and um, hopefully someday we'll be there. We're, we're trying to grow. Awesome, thanks. Um, uh, and I forgot to mention, but it, uh, if you wanted to unmute yourself and ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. I'll just keep reading them from the chat otherwise. But um, John is also asking, are there any initiatives occurring to resurrect American elms? Yeah, good question. I forgot to mention the elm. Of course, Dutch elm disease uh, killed a lot of the American elms. There's still some other elm species that survived it. I have not heard of any real efforts to restore the American elm tree. Um, and I don't know if there have been efforts or not, and maybe they tried and couldn't do it, but uh, the American elm has been greatly diminished by Dutch elm disease. Again, it's a non-native you know, virus from, from Netherlands, Holland, that came over and has killed, has killed lots of them. But I don't know if any effort has been made to restore it. It happened before they had the technology, I think. It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Awesome. Um, Jennifer is asking, do you know of any, um, currently any wildlife species that are dependent on the mature or old growth forests that are at risk of being endangered or extinct, um, similar to what happened to the ivory-billed woodpecker? Yeah, another excellent question. And around here, I can't think at the top of my head of a species that's old growth dependent. Out west, there certainly is the, uh, I believe it's the spotted owl out west is dependent upon old growth forests. Um, and if they're cut down, that, that species could go extinct. So they have protections to protect the old growth out west. Um, there's so little old growth left in the east that I, I don't know if this is specific species, but there's definite evidence showing that old growth forests have a much greater diversity and abundance of wildlife. So old growth forests do support a far greater diversity and a far greater abundance um, of animals. But, and I know that I, I can't think of a specific species, but I know that there are a lot of them 
I actually did a, did a little research. There are some rare threatened endangered species that occur in aquatic habitats and the need undisturbed aquatic habitats, streams that have never been disturbed. And um, those places, the best places are old growth forests where there haven't been you know, any kind of land, ground disturbance to cause erosion. The super high quality water is, is a thing that is required for some species. And that would be an old growth forest that's gonna have that super high quality water that some species do need to. There are some species of salamanders uh, and some fish and some smaller critters too, like mussels and stuff that do need super high quality water. And th those species do exist in old growth areas for sure, yeah, because of the water quality associated with them. Awesome, yeah, great question. Um, Guy and Judy are asking, uh, can the PowerPoint be made available? Sure, yeah, I'd be, I, I could uh, email that to uh, Moni and um, you're welcome to distribute it. If that, or if you want to email me directly, my email is on the screen. That info at EcoForces will get to me. And if you want, I can send it to you. Awesome. Yeah, if you want to send it, we can also um, include that in the follow-up email with the recording. So uh, if, if that works for you too, we can do that. Um, John is asking, how are longleaf pines doing? Yeah, longleaf pines, a coastal plain species. And again, it used to be literally, I think, millions and millions of acres of the coastal plain were longleaf pine open woodlands, like that picture I showed, but with longleaf pines. And again, they were all cut and the land was cleared in the coastal plain first off. Um, so it was greatly reduced to like maybe, I think literally like about two or 3% of it was left uncut. And they've now started restoring it and they figured out how to do it. Uh, you can go and you can plant longleaf pines now. You can cut down your loblolly plantation Instead of replanting loblolly densely, you can replant longleaf pines at a much greater spacing. And you do have to use fire usually. That is another fire dependent species. Longleaf pine needs fire. You have to burn it pretty, every couple of years you have to burn it. But in the flatlands down there in the coastal plain, it's pretty easy to burn. So um, they have had good success in restoring longleaf pine. I don't know the number they're up to now, but it might be maybe five or 6% of what was its original range but there are a number of rare threatened endangered species that are dependent upon those open longleaf pine forests for things. Awesome question. Um, another question that I have just kind of piggybacking off of Jennifer is mature forest and old growth forest interchangeable or are there differences between the two? Yeah, there, there are differences. Um, I might actually, if I can pull up the, the slide, did on the slide, I can show here what's going on. Um, the mature forest, right here, this is it. So the old growth forest, to get to true, pure old growth, you really have to have a virgin forest that has never been disturbed by humans. Um, and there's very, very little of that left. This is where the trees, hundreds of years, it takes hundreds of years to develop true old growth stages really you have to get the point where trees can live, you know, oaks and hemlocks can live for 400, even 600 years. You don't truly get old growth until actually all those trees have started dying. So it takes literally hundreds of years to get true old growth. And you'll have, an old growth forest is incredibly messy. You'll have giant big dead trees down on the ground, trees that you are hard to climb over. You'll have that. And those are great mulch and fertilizer. And those dead trees on the ground, um, one of the diversity benefits is that all the fungus that comes in and the insects that come in to break down those dead trees is a really important thing. And old growth forests have a lot more of those fungi out there in the forest and a lot more insects and greater diversity. And it really does take hundreds of years. A mature forest is a bit of a relative term. Um, and that can happen, you know, in as little as 60 to 80 years where you have trees that are what they call mature means you're not going to get any taller really, um, but they're still going to get bigger and, and, and wider and grow in girth. Um, but they may not get much taller after about 100 years or so, depending upon the species. Um, so it, there is a difference there. Uh, it, it can be quite significant um, in things. Yeah, good question. Awesome, thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, you're also welcome to unmute yourself and ask Andy your questions, or you can put them in the chat. I'll go ahead and do one live. How about that? <laughs> So, Andy, I, first of all, this has been fascinating. I, I've really enjoyed uh, all the information you shared uh, this evening. Thank you. I'm interested in, in the um, 
forest land that is owned by timber companies and paper companies um, versus the private individuals, you know, private landowners that are maybe just as you as you have as clients primarily, I think. Um, like how much of the forest is, I don't know if you know this, how much of the forest is owned by timber and paper corporations? At, you know, like is it yeah. half, 10% or what? And then how, and then second part of the question, how well do they align, these corporate entities align to these ecological practices? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. I know some of the, I don't know all the exact numbers on it. I'm more familiar with the numbers in Western North Carolina. In Western North Carolina, uh, roughly 25% of the forests are actually owned by the government, U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service. About 25% are actually publicly owned public national forest land. Um, about two thirds of the lands in Western North Carolina, two thirds of the forest land is privately owned by small family forest owners. There are virtually no timber companies that own land in Western North Carolina. And that's because the price of land in Western has gotten high where the price of the land is far more valuable to sell for real estate than it is to grow trees on. You can make a lot more so that Timber companies all sold their, they used to own millions of acres up here in the mountains when land was cheap back in the 1980s and prior to that. But starting in the 90s, the land values here got higher than the timber values were. So it was all sold. Land is still cheaper down in the Piedmont and definitely in the coastal plain. There are still timber industry that owns the land. I don't know the exact proportion of it. There's a lot less public land too in the Piedmont and the coastal plain. And there's a lot more industrial land but I still think the majority of the land is owned by small family for small private family forests is what makes up most of the forest uh, across all the Southeast. And um, these people are, are often doing timber harvest and supplying the timber companies, but the timber companies don't own as much land as they used to own. Uh, and when the timber companies own the land, they manage it sustainably. It wasn't ecological forestry, I wouldn't say. They would do clear cuts, but a clear cut done well will again allow in full sun and it'll allow competition and it's the fastest way to regrow your next crop of trees. And when the timber companies were managing the land for profit, but for sustainable profit, they managed them okay. It was not bad forestry. It was good, sustainable forestry, um, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call it ecological forestry though. That's a little different spin on things. Um, the problem that's happened now with timber ownership is there's uh, timber investment management organizations or real estate investment trusts that are buying up lots of these big timber lands and they're owning them. They may do a timber harvest. Most of them, there was a big worry because they were only owning the land temporarily and sometimes they would do a timber harvest and then sell the land. So they didn't have a long-term investment in the land like the timber companies that actually own the land. If you own the land, you're probably not going to mismanage it, but they'll, they'll manage it for short term, do a harvest and then sell it oftentimes. But there was worry that they might, they might actually do very unsustainable harvest. They would do these high grade harvests because they would just cut, take all the timber value off it and then sell it. Um, but that hasn't happened yet. So there hasn't been a problem with these timber investment organizations buying land as an investment, harvesting some timber and then selling it. They have still done sustainable forestry. It is not, it is not, it's not exactly ecological forestry, um, but it has been sustainable forestry. It has been, you know, good forestry that meets all the minimum standards that are required. So the, the timber, timber management, you know, no one likes to see land clear cut. That's, humans just don't like to see trees cut in general. Um, but that actually is sustainable forestry. That's the, and it's a way, you know, they wouldn't be doing it. They wouldn't have been doing it for timber companies when they own the land, if it was gonna degrade things to do that. If it's done well, um, the, trees will, the trees will grow back if it's done properly. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of an answer to your question. I don't know the exact numbers, but the majority of the land is owned by small family forests. I think the average size is about 50 acres. Yeah. Uh, it's management a lot more tricky. It's a lot easier when you, I mean, the companies used to own, you know, thousands or even millions of acres. They could do a lot bigger, better management on those big tracks. It's a lot harder to manage all these little 50 acre pieces put together. Uh, makes makes it more challenging puzzle to put together. Yeah. It's just a surprise to me because I'm from Maine and, and in Maine, I think the, uh, uh, timber and paper companies own half the state. Yeah, much. Because land is cheap. Land yeah. is cheap. They can they can make enough money off the off the value of the land. Just the timber will pay for the land and make a profit for them. But that that has has ceased to be the case around around here. Um, the 
this development and population of growth. And I, I can tie in the one question, I saw a question pop about uh, SFI and, and FSC. These are certified sustainable forestry standards, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and the Forest Stewardship Council. And the, the good thing with these organizations is the timber companies realized that people wanted to have some proof they were doing sustainable forestry. That people saw these clear cuts and were, you know, didn't like them or horrified by them sometimes. So these independent third party organizations came in to oversee it to make sure it was sustainable. And so these uh, certified sustainable forestry, you know, if you want to buy products that you, you have a guarantee were done sustainably, you can look for these logos, the SFI logo or the FSC logo. Usually on paper products, it's, it's getting more common. And even on lumber you buy at, at you know, Lowe's or Home Depot, you can find this lumber there. It costs a little more definitely to buy it. Um, and it costs more because they have to pay for this company to come in and certify their forestry as being sustainable. But so far, all of the, the current timber companies are trying, are trying to follow these standards because they know society is, is requiring that uh, for things. The tough thing is it's, a, it's very difficult for a small family forest on her own, you know, even a couple hundred acres, you know, even three, 400 acres. It's really hard for them to go through these certification standards. Uh, it's too costly for them to do it, but uh, the big companies can do it. So it's not something that uh, is is doable for a, a a small a small landowner. Unfortunately, it's just too too expensive, and they're trying to find ways. The same thing is true with the carbon forest carbon projects I mentioned. Um, it's it's too hard for a small landowner. It's too costly. That they're started. That's changing quite rapidly now. It is becoming much more possible. If you are a small private forest owner, you can do uh, in the carbon markets and sell the carbon that's stored in your forest to companies that are polluting to kind of have, they can offset your offset their carbon emissions by paying you to keep the carbon in your trees on your forest standing so yeah there's a lot of good certifications and as they're coming up um, but they are labor intensive to have a, a third party come in and oversee it both the sustainability standards and the carbon standards require a third party to come in and, and look at your forest to guarantee it's being done right I had, I had a question mm -hmm. Andy what do you think of I was reading about uh, in eastern North Carolina and I guess other places in the southeast uh, countries like Great Britain are using trees to meet their renewable energy standards and I think there isn't there a huge facility I think in Wilmington that is uh, shipping a lot of these trees. I, what do you think of that? Yeah, that, that's been very controversial. So the European uh, climate standards for sustainable fuel production and heating allowed wood pellets as a sustainable uh, energy source. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, obviously oil and natu even natural gas are not sustainable. Coal definitely is, you know, a, a, a very poor one for carbon. Uh, for for you know climate change, so the European market was oh we can you can use wood chips, but European they don't have the supply of trees in Europe to make these wood chips. So in eastern North Carolina and a lot of the coastal plain areas, there this market sprung up for these wood chips, and you can take very low value very low value trees. You don't have to take the big really nice ones. You can harvest those poor quality trees that should be harvested out of a forest. You can harvest them. So they they harvest them here in, in eastern North America, chip them up here put them on giant ocean liners and ship them over to Europe. And that's where they, they actually realized that this is changing, that it, it, when you factor in the cost of manufacturing these, these ships here and shipping them across the ocean to Europe, it's really not carbon neutral. Um, and it, it really, I think they're gonna change that standard. But unfortunately, there are this, there's a huge, this is huge massive mills you've talked about in, on the, you know, in the south, southeastern coastal plant all over the place that are shipping these here. So they've set up this system because there was this demand for Europe and because it's already kind of been an established standard that was allowed, it's gonna be really hard to roll that back. But it seems like it's not, it might be better than using you know, coal or maybe oil. I don't know the details. The head, there has been analysis of it, but it really is shown it is not a, a really good um, carbon neutral energy source to take trees from the US and ship them and send them to Europe. Um, if they use it locally on a small scale, it could be done, but that's not what's happening. So and to make it financially profitable, you have to do it in a really big scale and, and harvest, you know, truck and truckloads of these trees and send over literally giant, giant boatloads of these trees to Europe to make money on it. Um, 
the economies of scale are hard to do and look at energy production. So I don't, I don't see I don't see trees as being a major, you know, uh, energy from trees as being a major contributor to uh, sustainable energy that would be carbon neutral. Uh, but it can be done, definitely can be done on a small local scale. It's been done in New England. They'll use wood chips there. They'll take those low value trees out of the way. It's actually a really good thing for forestry because it gives a market. So you actually can cut down the smaller, less desirable trees and just chip them up and use them for fuel. So they actually give some value to those low value trees, which otherwise are left in the woods, which degrades the forest. So you can do some actually some good forest improvement work to again, thin out those lower, smaller trees and open up the forest, good trees to grow. But it's, it's, they tried to do that in North Carolina up in the mountains here, but the cost of logging in the mountains was way too high and, uh, but they can do it in the coastal plain, but it's, it's, it's controversial. Andy. Thanks. Andy. Yes. They, they've, uh, they have photography to prove it. They're not harvesting the scrap wood in the forest. They're cutting down huge trees. They're cutting down trees along the rivers. And in, in Europe, they're cutting down trees in Croatia. They're over 500 years old to make pe pellets. Yeah. And in a time of climate crisis, cutting down trees is like the worst thing you could do. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's all about how it's done. And yeah, this, so it could be done well if it was done in the right place in the right way, but. It, it's not happening that way. Yeah, they're, they're cutting down some valuable trees too for that, yeah. So, so it's been very controversial on things, yeah. And that, that is a great point you brought up there. So yeah, that the, a big tree stores a lot more carbon, but a younger tree stores more carbon more quickly. So people were arguing for a while, oh, we should cut down more trees and let young trees grow. If you do it sustainably and regrow trees, but they realized quickly that that was a false pretense that cutting down that big tree removed so much carbon that even though the younger trees were sequestering carbon a little bit faster, you had removed so much carbon from taking on the big tree that it was not beneficial. People were trying to tout that also. There's been a lot of misinformation out there and thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's a good point. It's how, 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 how things are done is very important and it can be done well and it can be done poorly. So it's, it's a very complex issue. So thanks for Talking about that, Andy, I just wanted to throw in here, our island wildlife chapter that's down there in the Wilmington area recently, this past summer, did a webinar on exactly that. So I'm just mm -hmm. going to share it in the chat. So in case anybody missed that, um, you're welcome to listen in on that discussion. Um, but I'll turn it back over to Monty unless there's any other questions. Good. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Andy, it's been a, a highly informative and interesting uh, presentation. I really appreciated all the dialogue, uh, obviously generated a lot of interest. Um, just wanna thank you on behalf of the South Wake Conservationists and the North Carolina Wildlife Federation um, for presenting to us today. And uh, this is recorded, so we're gonna have this up in our library, um, which is on the North Carolina Wildlife Federation website, as well as our South Wake Conservationists website. So uh, those that weren't able to make it tonight will still be able to, uh, to learn about this. So again, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and wish you well in your uh, eco-forestry going forward. Save those Appalachian forests for us. Yeah, thank I wanted to make one last opportunity. comment, and I thought it was a great presentation. Thanks. My daughter is actually a forest, she works for the Forest Service in Idaho. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm definitely going to send her a copy of this presentation. She'll enjoy it. Great. Hey, right, thank you. It's been my our pleasure. Son, our son's a forester in the city of New York City, <laughs> so we'll send it to him too. <laughs> Urban forester, great. Good, All good. right. Yeah. If you have more questions, my contact information was on the screen there. I'd be happy to follow up with anyone who has more questions on things. Okay. Thanks everybody for joining tonight. Thanks again, Andy, and everybody have a good night. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye.